Hello, and welcome back to our channel. My name is Samantha, and I'm the tailor for the Jamestown Yorktown Foundation. Today, we're going to take a look at how I use primary sources like written records, paintings, and drawings, and surviving garments from the time periods we interpret to create the clothing that our interpreters wear in the outdoor areas. These primary sources help me know what kinds of garments to make and what materials to make them out of. Just like the information that our interpreters share with visitors, we want the clothing they wear to be as accurate as possible to the time period, location, culture, and social class they're interpreting. While a number of garments do survive from the 17th century that were made and worn in Europe, no English clothing survives that was worn or made at Jamestown in the early 17th century for us to study. But we can learn a lot from written records, like the Farrar papers, to understand what clothing the English colonists were wearing at Jamestown. The Farrar papers are a collection of documents from the Farrar family, which was heavily involved in the Virginia Company. Brothers John and Nicholas Farrar both served as deputy treasurer of the company. By order of the Privy Council in 1623, Nicholas Farrar collected and turned over a number of documents related to the administration of the Virginia Company for investigation into why the company was struggling and whether or not their royal charter should be revoked. These papers, containing letters, bills, receipts, and other documents, formed the basis of the Farrar Papers, which now reside at Magdalene College, Cambridge. Luckily for me and other historians interested in the material culture of Jamestown, the bills and receipts include information about all of the stuff necessary for provisioning the English colonists in Virginia, such as tools, firearms, books, food, and yes, even clothing. I can compare what is mentioned in those documents to what appears in similar documents from England, as well as visual sources, such as paintings and drawings, to understand what kind of clothes the English colonists at Jamestown were really wearing in the early 17th century. So what can we learn from the Farrar papers about the clothes worn by English colonists in Virginia? First of all, we can find out what types of garments are being worn. For men's clothing, there are lots of references to the purchase of breeches, doublets, and cassocks. If you've gotten a chance to watch our videos about getting dressed in the 17th century, you'll remember that these garments form the basis of a man's everyday outfit. Breeches cover the lower half of the body, and a close-fitting doublet or a loose-fitting cassock is worn on top. For example, in 1620, the ship Elizabeth was containing a barrel with 15 pairs of breeches in it to Virginia, as well as 19 doublets and 19 cassocks. Cassocks appear frequently in the Farrar papers, but don't show up with the same frequency in records for average Englishmen. In England, cassocks are primarily associated with soldiers and sailors, where it makes sense for men to be wearing a loosely fitted garment with a wide range of motion that could be easily and quickly mass produced. Cassocks are a common sight here at Jamestown Settlement on our sailors down at the ships as well as in the fort. There are many references to suits of clothing for men, which probably consisted of a matching pair of breeches and either a doublet or cassock, such as the 24 suits sent in the ship Marmaduke in 1621. But doublets, cassocks, and breeches aren't the only male garments to appear in the Farrar papers. Benjamin Blewett, a merchant and member of the Governor's Council, recorded a purchase of enough frieze, a woolen fabric, to have two jerkins made up, as well as the cost of paying a tailor to make the jerkins. Worn over a doublet, jerkins provided protection or warmth when made out of leather or wool, although they could also be just a fashionable garment when made out of silk. Men seeking additional warmth might wear a woolen garment called a waistcoat under their doublets. The Farrar papers show that 20 waistcoats were purchased in January 1620, and a barrel containing five green waistcoats was sent to Virginia in the ship Furtherance in 1622. Period images also depict men wearing just their waistcoats over their shirts when doing manual labor in the heat, which certainly could have occurred in Virginia. I was very excited to see men's waistcoats in the Farrar papers to provide concrete evidence that they were worn in Virginia. Sleeveless waistcoats are a great period option for English interpreters to wear in the hot, humid summers of Virginia, and when doing manual labor in the fort or climbing the rigging of the ships. 
It might surprise you to learn that there actually is a lot of information about English women's clothing in the Farrar papers as well. The papers record purchases from 1620 through 1622 when large numbers of English women came to Virginia to become wives for the colonists. All 12 women traveling to Virginia on the ship Marmaduke in 1622 were given full sets of clothing by the Virginia Company to help start their new lives. This included two smocks, one petticoat, one waistcoat, two pairs of stockings, one pair of garters, one pair of gloves, one hat and hat band, one round band or collar, one apron, two pairs of shoes, two coifs, and one cross cloth. These purchases were recorded in the Farrar papers, and we even have the specific receipts for the hats and the gloves, which we know were made out of white kid skin. For more information about each of these garments and how they were worn, be sure to check out our video about getting dressed in the 17th century as an English woman. An important English women's garment that shows up in the Farrar papers is one that was becoming more common in the average English woman's wardrobe by the 1620s. Six pairs of bodies were purchased in 1620 and 1621. Essentially the predecessor of the corset, pairs of bodies were a stiffened support garment that began to be worn by elite English women at the very end of the 1500s and eventually made their way down the social scale. Pairs of bodies utilized flexible but strong materials such as baleen, known as whalebone in our period, to provide support to women's torsos and create a fashionable silhouette. Prior to pairs of bodies, women wore a one-piece garment consisting of a bodice stiffened with layers of quilted sturdy fabric with an attached skirt, which was either called a kirtle or a petticoat. As separate pairs of bodies became more common, petticoats lost their attached bodices and became just underskirts the way that we know them today. And those underskirts could be worn with the separate pairs of bodies. Both kirtles and petticoats are mentioned in the Farrar papers, along with separate pairs of bodies, which reflects the gradual transition taking place in English women's fashion during this time period. At Jamestown Settlement, we primarily dress English women in kirtles and petticoats with attached bodices stiffened with layers of quilted fabric, since currently we portray the years of about 1610 to 1614 in the recreated fort and we can point to the Farrar papers to show that those garments were still being worn in the early 1620s, even as separate pairs of bodies became more common. Two of the pairs of bodies recorded in the Farrar papers were purchased for two Powhatan women who accompanied Pocahontas on her journey to England in 1617, and were now being sent to the Summer Isles by the Virginia Company. Like the 12 English women traveling on the ship Marmaduke, the Powhatan women received a fairly complete wardrobe, including coifs, aprons, smocks, petticoats, gowns, stockings, and shoes, as well as the pairs of bodies. Not only do the records provide information about the clothing, they highlight the ways in which the English believed their culture to be superior to the Powhatan, and how they attempted to erase the women's indigenous identity. We don't know their Powhatan names, only the English names they were replaced with, Mary and Elizabeth. Nine women's gowns are mentioned in the Farrar papers as well. While today we usually use the word gown for fancy dresses like ball gowns or wedding gowns, in the early 17th century, gowns were just another type of outer garment for both men and women. The term dress referred to the act of getting dressed or a style or category of clothing as a whole but not a single garment the way that we use it today. Women's gowns could have a fitted bodice and attached skirt or be loose and long like a long cassock, but they were always worn over other garments like a petticoat and pair of bodies or a kirtle. Accessories and wardrobe staples like undergarments, shirts and smocks were often mass produced in England and could be purchased cheaply in large quantities and sent to Virginia. The Farrar papers show that the Virginia Company purchased stockings, shoes, and falling band collars like this one by the hundreds. William Webb sold over 500 pairs of stockings to the Virginia Company. One specific style of stocking that is recorded in the Farrar papers is the Irish stocking. Instead of being knitted, Irish stockings were likely cut from a thick woolen fabric, which made them quick and easy to mass produce, as well as comfortable to wear in cold and damp Virginia winters. 
Even John Smith recommended a pair of Irish stockings in his list of provisions for those wishing to come to Virginia. Assistant Fort Supervisor Brian Beckley has happily been wearing his Irish stockings for many winters and reports that they keep his feet warm and dry and don't wear out as quickly as knit stockings. We can also learn about the types of materials used to make the clothing worn in Virginia. In some cases, it's as obvious as the purchase of thread, fabric, and tools specifically for the production and maintenance of clothing by tailors. Two pairs of tailor's shears and two pressing irons were purchased from Thomas Carter in December of 1620. Blue and brown thread was sent to Virginia aboard the ship Abigail along with hundreds of needles. Taylor's shears, irons, and needles have all been found in the archaeological digs at James Fort. It's unlikely that the first tailor to arrive in Virginia, William Love, did much of any tailoring after he got here, but subsequent tailors in Virginia certainly used their skills to keep colonists in serviceable clothing. The most common fabrics in the Farrar papers are those made from linen and wool. Richard Bull sold an immense amount of linen fabric to the Virginia Company such as cheap Osnaburg linen and finer Holland linen for undergarments and accessories, and canvas. Canvas came in a variety of weights for anything from ship's sails to men's shirts, and was most likely bleached white or left the natural color of flax, a sort of grayish beige. It was a popular choice for men's clothing in Virginia, where the hot and humid summers made breathable and lighter weight fabrics the most desirable. 180 suits of canvas are mentioned in the Farrar papers. You will see lots of linen canvas, breeches, doublets, and cassocks at Jamestown Settlement during the summer. Six suits are noted as being made of cloth, a term that in the 17th century usually refers to woolen fabrics. A shipment of goods on the ship Marmaduke contained 12 frieze suits. Ideal for cold winter weather, Freeze was made from cheap wool fleeces into a thick and heavy fabric with a hairy nap on at least one side for extra insulation. John Smith recommended that anyone coming to Virginia bring one suit of canvas, one suit of cloth, and one suit of freeze to be properly outfitted for the seasonal weather extremes in Virginia. So clearly, these fabrics were practical and proven materials for clothing suited to life in Virginia, and colonists were actually wearing them in the early 17th century. I hope you've enjoyed this look at just one example of how we use primary sources to understand the clothing of the past and recreate it for our interpreters in the outdoor living history areas. The next time you visit us at Jamestown Settlement, be sure to ask our interpreters about what they're wearing. Thanks for watching. Don't forget to hit the like button and subscribe to our channel so that you can catch all of our new videos. See you next time.